host, Sabrina Salvati. Dooby dooby doo. Hello, hello. Welcome, guys. Happy Monday. Welcome, welcome. Shout out to everyone watching on YouTube, Rockfin, and Twitter. Welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. If you are new, I want to let you know that Savvy Sab's podcast is a part of Revolutionary Blackout Network. You can catch me there on Thursday for the roundtable and Friday for the Savvy Show. And you can catch me here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. All right. I want to give shout outs to people in the chat. I hope everyone had a great weekend. Shout out to Plum Drum says, LOL, Leo. I don't know what that's about, but welcome. Shout out to Miguel says, peace. Greetings, Hannah G says, Sabby Mondays. All right. All right. Let's do it. Shout out to Cryptician says, Sabby and RBN coming straight to you from the left side, y'all, with the socialist fist bump of solidarity. You know how we do it. Welcome. Welcome. Shout out to the traveler says, hi y'all. Hope you all had a good Monday. Shout out to gamer and ganja for life says, hello. What's going on? Lawrence Johnson. Always great to see you. He's a savvy member says dooby dooby doo Monday, Monday. Can't trust that day. Shout out to Eric. Who's a savvy member says happy money left day friends. I think he meant Monday, or maybe he did mean money. <laughs> Shout out to Bryce says, sup, everyone, and Sabby. Sup, Bryce. Greetings, Leroy, who's a Sabby member, says, comrades, peace. What's going on? Sean says, hello from the UK. It's midnight, just gone. So Tuesday morning here. Oh, welcome, welcome. Shout out to Corey says, Jimmy just exposed how Anna flip flopped in 24 hours. LMAO. Yes. Yes. Oh, that was, those were interesting uh, videos there. This past week has been interesting. Shout out to Jenna who says, plant sunshine, plant sunshine, plant. What's going on? Mr. X says, hello, Sabby. Hello, all greetings to you, Mr. X. Shout out to Franny says, hey, Sabby. Hello, Franny. Greetings, Ian says, free dabs for Sabs. Hey, I like that. <laughs> I like that, that uh, phrase there. Shout out to Jonathan says, hey, Sabby. I saw your interview on JD and it was outstanding as usual. Thanks so much, Jonathan. That was a fun time. Greetings, Osito says, hi, everyone. Jumping back and forth from you and JD. I don't know how you guys do that. <laughs> I really don't know how you guys watch two things at once. Shout out to Hunter says solidarity forever. That's right. Greeting Steve says hello. Hello, Steve. Shout out to Ashura says Anna tight bun banana just walked her BS in 24 hours faster than Jamal Bowman exposed himself. Ouch. Greetings in the Fed. I just rewatched your video interview with Nick Brahma. Whoa, WTF. Oh God, that interview. <laughs> What's going on, Notori says, I freaking love you. I freaking love you too, Notori. All right, all right, guys. What are we talking about tonight? Let me go ahead and share my screen. You guys are gonna have to bear with me a little bit. I have, um, I can kind of hear part of my voice echoing in my ear. <laughs> I don't know if uh, you guys know what I mean by that, but yeah, just allergies, man. It's, it's that time of year. All right. Tonight we are talking about Nina Turner and Ryan Grimm discuss the right Democrats. What is that about? We're going to get into that discussion. I'm also going to discuss Chris Hedges prediction about the Democratic Party. That'll be interesting to listen to as well. And we're going to talk about Amazon board under fire. What else is happening with Amazon? Oof, can't wait to get into those stories. Also want to give a quick shout out to everyone who is a savvy patron. Thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it, guys. If you want to become a patron, I have five categories. Members, savvy, sabsters, sabinators, and ultimate. Here are all of their names here. Thank you guys so much. And I want to give a special shout out to new patrons, which are Dark and Vidal 
Gomez. Thank you so much. You'll also see their name scrolling across the bottom of the screen. So let's go ahead and get into it, guys. We have a lot to say. Also want to let you guys know I will be on Tara Reed's show tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So that should be an awesome discussion as well. Yes, I did. Miguel, I did get a haircut. <laughs> and I got my highlights touched up too. It was much needed. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and get into the first story. I'm going to start off with Chris Hedges. Um, I think I've told you guys this before, but if you're not doing so, I think you should follow him on Substack because... His articles are really good. And then he also has an audio version of his articles that you can listen to. So if you don't have time to sit down and read them, but he posted a recent article. And this is really interesting. I want you guys to hear this It's called Jesus endless war and the rise of American fascism. Uh Oh, what happened there? I don't know what I did. I clicked on the wrong. Okay, there we go. I hope it's back. Yeah. Chris Hedges, uh, you know, he has a lot to say about the Democratic Party and he's always on point, always on point. And I don't know if you guys know this, but um, he mentioned one time in an re- uh, interview I saw last year that he doesn't he didn't vote Democrat. So he was ahead of this before before me, <laughs> before people like me. All right. So let's go ahead and get into this article. So Chris Hedges says the Democratic Party is hoping to thwart an election route by running against the expected Supreme Court decision on abortion. This is depressingly all that is left of its political capital. Oh, guys, this is such a good article. And then here's the image here. You can see there's a gentleman here with the cross with the American flag on it. And then here's a skull or skeleton. So let's, let's get into this because he's calling out things that a lot of us have been complaining about for the past couple of days with this whole issue with the Supreme court leak and Roe versus Wade. I want you to listen to what he says here. Make this a little bit larger. The democratic party, which had 50 years to write Roe v. Wade into law with Jimmy Carter Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, in full control of the White House and Congress at the inception of their presidencies, is banking its electoral strategy, and this is what I predicted, around the expected Supreme Court decision to lift the judicial prohibition on the ability of the states to enact laws restricting or banning abortions. I doubt it would work. Now, let's listen to this for a second. And I'll go back into the article. This is exactly what those of us over at RBN, we've been predicting. I don't know all the ins and outs about the Supreme Court document leak. I only know what was reported. And unfortunately, I don't live in D.C., so I can't just go up to the Capitol around D.C. and ask people questions. That's an unfortunate thing. But I found the timing of this to be somewhat suspect. It's a midterm year. Democrats are not polling well. Joe Biden's poll numbers continue to decrease. He is losing African-American voters heavily right now. I think last time I I checked on here, it was what, down to 67% for African-American support for Joe Biden? They know that they are in danger of losing the House and possibly the Senate this year. But that is all on them. So this is what I felt was happening. I felt that what they are doing is they are using this Supreme Court leak to help them win in the midterms this year. Now, what Chris Hedges just said there is absolutely true. There were multiple times that the Democratic Party could have codified Roe v. Wade into law, and they chose not to. In 2009, Obama decided that abortion was not going to be a priority for the Democratic Party. 
in 2017, Nancy Pelosi is on record saying that this is not going to be a priority for the Democratic Party. So all these different opportunities that they had to make sure that this stayed in place, they chose not to pursue it. And I believed that that was done on purpose. I felt like they kept this in the back of their pocket, kind of like a gotcha card. And they were just waiting to pull it out when they could use it towards their advantage. I don't really think for the Democratic Party, it's really so much about the American people and protecting women per se. I don't really think it's about that at all. I think it's about them trying to win in the midterms. Now, Amy Klobuchar went on Twitter and she said this herself. I will be fighting for this from now until November. She was ratioed in that tweet, by the way. She made it very, very obvious. So let's go back into the article here. So Chris Hedges says, I doubt it will work. The Democratic Party's hypocrisy and duplicity is the fertilizer for Christian fascism. It's exclusive focus on the culture wars and identity politics at the expense of economic, political, and social justice fueled a right-wing backlash and stoked the bigotry, racism, and sexism it sought to curtail. It's opting for image over substance, including its repeated failure to secure the right to abortion left the Democrats distrusted and reveled. The Biden administration invited Amazon labor union president Chris Smalls and union workers from Starbucks and other organizations to the White House. At the same time, it rewarded a $10 billion contract to the union busting Amazon and the National Security Agency for cloud computing. Let me go down here. Democrats have failed to address the structural injustices that turned America into an oligarch state, which the obscenely rich squabble like children in a sandbox over multi-billion toys. The longer this game of political theater continues, the worse things will get. Let's talk about the political theater for just a second. What they do is they put on a smile and a good face and they pretend like they're actually fighting for these issues. They'll take photo ops with activists to make it seem like they're on the side of the activists. But when it comes to actually passing legislation, they don't deliver. In short, they're not passing any bills on any of these issues that they claim to be fighting for. They just want to take pictures and virtue signal. It is more important for the Democratic Party to focus on an image than to focus on actually putting these policies into law so that the American people can actually get some type of tangible benefits. It is more important for them to focus on image. This is why you'll see them focus on she's the first woman. He's the first black man. uh, She's the first black woman. She's the first Latina woman. They focus on identity politics. Because they know that that's something that they can use to cater to their base. If it's not for the African-American vote, the Democratic Party doesn't win. Period. So they're always trying to find ways that they can virtue signal to the minority groups so that they can win. Because again, without our vote, Democrats don't win. And they know that. But when it comes to actually passing bills, legislation, implementing policies that are actually going to help minority groups in this country, that are going to help working class people, poor people, actually nowadays, even middle class people, they don't deliver and they don't plan to. This is what I want everyone to understand. They don't plan to deliver. They just plan to virtue signal so that you think they're going to deliver so that you'll vote for them. This has been going on for decades. And this is why nothing gets done. So let's go back in here. So I want to go down to this part right here. This is important to note. 
The Christian fascists make up perhaps 30% of the electorate, roughly equivalent to the percentage of Americans who believe abortion is murder. They are organized, committed to a vision, however perverse, and awash in money. John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Amy Coney, Amy Coney Barrett, sorry, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Gorsuch, I don't know how you pronounce his last name, and Brett Kavanaugh, mediocre jurist and Federalist Society ideologues who carry the banner of Christian fascism control the Supreme Court. Now, this goes back into another point that I want to make that some people have been bringing up as well. If you remember back during Obama's presidency, remember when Barack Obama had the option to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. At that point, she was she was sick. She wasn't doing well. Remember this? Like It happened a couple of times where she was sick, but he had the option to replace her. Remember, Ruth Bader Ginsburg decided to stay in. Then... Trump took office and she died during Trump's presidency. So Donald Trump was like, boom, I'm going to fill that spot. That spot went to Amy Coney Barrett. Knowing that during Barack Obama's presidency, Ruth Bader Ginsburg should have retired. I don't believe that this is a coincidence. I don't believe that this just happened to happen that way. I believe that this is by design because they can always point to someone else for the reason why they didn't do what they said they would do. Right now, Democrat lawmakers, they're blaming people who didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. They're claiming that if Hillary would have won, if you would have voted for her, then we wouldn't be in this situation. And I've just been reminding people that Hillary Clinton's running mate, Tim Kaine, was also anti-choice. They don't want to hear that part though. They don't want to hear that part. It's all by design. And now they are really banking on this. They're really trying to run on this. They're trying to use fear once again. And what did I tell you guys? Every election cycle, this is what they do. They find one issue or for the last couple of years, it wasn't an issue. It was a person and that was Trump. And they use that to try to fear monger towards people. You better vote for Hillary Clinton or you're going to get Trump. You better vote for Joe Biden or you're going to get Trump. Now they're saying you better vote for Democrats in the midterms or otherwise. We're not going to get the opportunity to codify Roe v. Wade into law, even though they had multiple opportunities to do that. This is what they do. I'm going to go to these super chats and then I'll go back into the article. Thank you for the super chat, Andrew Matthews. Both you and Jimmy are vengeance tonight. (laughs) Thanks, Andrew. Thank you for the super chat, The Traveler. And Dems just let Trump nominate Amy Coney Barrett. Exactly. This is all by design, guys. So let's go back in. So there's another part here that I want to say. The ruling class in both parties told lies about NAFTA, trade deals, reforming welfare, abolishing financial regulations, austerity, the Iraq war, and neoliberalism that did far more damage to the American public than any lie told by Trump. Now this, again, this is coming from Chris Hedges. The reptilian slime oozes out of every pore of these politicians, from Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to Biden, who backed the 1976 Hyde Amendment banning federal funding of abortions, and in 1982 voted to support a constitutional amendment that would allow states to overturn Roe v. Wade. Their hypocrisy is not lost on the public even with their armies of consultants, pollsters, and courtiers in the press, public relation teams, and advertising agencies. And I want to point out this. When it comes to the women's rights issues, Joe Biden was never on our side. 
I'm glad that Chris mentioned the Hyde Amendment and the opportunity where he had to address Roe v. Wade later on. He was never on our side, you guys. Never. That's why it was funny to me when people are like, why hasn't Joe Biden said anything about what's happening at the Supreme Court? What is he going to say? He's never been on our side. When it came to the women's rights issues, he's never been on our side. Think about it. He wouldn't even let Anita Hill's witnesses testify when she, when she, um, oh shoot, what was his name? Oh, Clarence Thomas. That's bad. I almost forgot Clarence Thomas's name. Wow. When she was testifying about Clarence Thomas, it was Joe Biden who prevented that from happening. So I just want to say that because I do want to remind people, and I'm seeing this all over mainstream media, why hasn't Joe Biden offered an opinion? What is he going to say? Look at his track record. Let's go back in. Hate is the fuel of American politics. No one votes for who they want. They vote against those they hate. Black and brown marginal communities have suffered worse assaults than the white working class, but they have been defanged politically with militarized police that function as internal armies of occupation. The erosion of due process, the world's largest prison system, and the stripping away of all rights including often voting rights because of felony convictions, as well as a loss of access to most social services and jobs, reduce them to a substance level on the lowest rung of America's caste system. They are also the primary targets of Republican-sponsored voter suppression and redistricting. Now listen to this, the glue holding this Christianized fascism together is not prayer, although we will get a lot of that, but war, war is the raison de, I don't know how to say this, but Dietre, I think of all systems of totalitarianism, war justifies a constant search for internal enemies. It is used to revoke basic civil liberties and impose censorship. War demonizes those in the Middle East, Russia, or China who are blamed for the economic and social debacles that inevitably get worse. Listen to this part. War diverts the rage. Whoops, it skipped ahead there somehow engendered by a dysfunctional state towards immigrants, people of color, feminists, liberals, artists, anyone who does not identify as heterosexual, the press, Antifa, Jews, Muslims, Russians, or Asians. Take your pick. It is a bigoted smorg smorgasbord. Every item on the menu is fair game. Listen to this part here. I don't want to read the entire article because I really think that you should read this article. Oh, where did I go? Here we go. The political deformities we have spawned are not unique. They are the product of a society and government that no longer functions on behalf of the citizenry. One that has been seized by a tiny cabal in our case corporate to serve its exclusive interest. The airy promises politicians make, including the announcement by candidate Barack Obama that the first thing he would do in office was sign the Freedom of Choice Act, which during his eight years as president, he never got around to doing are worthless. One more time. The airy promises politicians make, including the announcement by candidate Barack Obama that the first thing he would do in office was sign the Freedom of Choice Act, which during his eight years as president, he never got around to doing are worthless. This is all they do. 
This is all they do. They make these promises. They say what they're going to do their first year. The first year goes by. The media makes excuses for them. The second year goes by. They still make excuses. Then they get to a point where they start to point fingers at other people and say that that's why they couldn't do it. Right now, the Democrats have majority in the House, the Senate, and the White House. Several things that Joe Biden ran on, he could have already done. Come this November, when Dems lose in the midterms, and I still believe that they will, next year, the excuse that they're going to make is that we couldn't get these things done because we don't have the House and the Senate. But the first two years of this presidency, they have the House and the Senate. I just want to say this because I want to come right back to this statement Next year, they have the House and the Senate. Same thing with Barack Obama. For two years, he had the House and the Senate. And this is another game that they play. They wait until they know they're not going to lose, or excuse me, they're not going to win the House and the Senate back so that they can use that as their rotating villain. We didn't have the House and the Senate. While they have the House and the Senate, they'll use other people as rotating villains whether it's Kirsten Cinema, whether it's Joe Manchin, this Senate parliamentarian, which all of a sudden seems to have a lot of power and most of us have never heard of this person before. Want to remind you, Kamala Harris, as the vice president, she's the tiebreaker. She deferred to the Senate parliamentarian. They'll find anyone else to blame. You have members in Congress, like the squad, who are saying you know, Joe Biden's doing a good job. They're defending Joe Biden when they're on these interviews and they're saying, why hasn't President Biden done such and such? But then in return, you have Joe Biden pointing fingers at Congress and say, why well, I haven't done this because Congress hasn't sent me a bill across my desk. This is how it works. Chris Hedges is aware of that. The scheduled vote next week in the Senate on a bill asserting the, that abortions are illegal in the United States, which is expected to be blocked by the Republicans' use of the filibuster, a Senate procedural rule that requires 60 votes to advance most legislation in the 100-member chamber is another empty gesture. And he's right. This is just another way for them to make it seem like they're trying to do something, even though they know they're not going to be able to do it. It's not going to pass. They already know. I'm going to go to some of the comments. Bart said, Chris Hedges is a genius in societal awareness. Well said. Ava said, I wish Sabby would offer a link to this article. Eric, can you put the link to that article in the chat? So that way they can see the full article. Angela said Anita Hill was brutalized by Joe and the gang. It was disgusting to watch back then. And I never forgot Joe's smugness. Agreed. Agreed. Cryptician said Chris Hedges is laying it all down hard and straight exactly as it should be for everyone to see. Right. Right. Definitely follow him on, um, on Substack. So let's see. Oh, Eric, did you find the link? Let me know if you need it. Loud and sound says Sabby is a genius of societal awareness in NGL. Oh, thank you. Oh, you guys are so sweet. You guys are too sweet. Bill Bradley said it's a great fundraising and voting issue for the Dems. No incentive to solve the problem when they are benefiting from it being in jeopardy. Well said. Well said. Um, Corey said, Sabby, when black people stop voting Democrat, they are through, LOL. I know, right? This is true. Al said, Chris Hedges voted green. We have options. Yep, he sure did. I know, I saw him say that on the interview. Um, let me see, Eric, did you find the link or you need me to give it to you? 
Let me know in the uh, private chat. I can't tell. Oh, I see it. Okay, sorry. Okay, so Eric just put the link in the chat for that article. Right there. Let's go ahead and get into our second story. So uh, <laughs> we had a long discussion about this Friday about justice Democrats and about the strategy of putting progressives through the Democratic Party. And we also talked about this past week, Nina Turner's election, what happened there, the squad not giving their support, et cetera, et cetera. New information has come out, and I do want to go ahead and get into that. Now, go to that. Nina Turner had an interview, uh, I believe this may have been Friday morning. Yeah, because I usually pick my stories the night before, and I think I saw this Friday morning, and I was like, oh, shoot. And I was like, nope, I already picked my story, so I'll do it on Monday. Uh, but I try not to be more than two days late with news. I usually try to pick my stories the night before. Um, and so yes, I will answer you really quick. Salty granny. Can you please explain to me why it's bad for the States to decide? Have you seen what they're trying to do in Louisiana? Let me see if I can pull that up for you really quick. Let me see if I can pull it up. What's going to happen with the states is obviously some states are going to be more strict than others. Like I can already tell you, I used to live down south, so I already know some of these southern states are going to have harsher uh, restrictions. So let me pull it up. Louisiana bill. All right. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and share this with you. I'll share my screen. And then I'll get into the second story here. Oh, my! what happened here? I can't figure out where this is. Sorry, my hair was sticking up. Um, share screen. Thank you for that question, by the way. And this is something I should have put up here. Um, so I don't know if everyone has seen this. Now, this is from Pam Keith. Pam said Louisiana is voting on a bill to criminalize IUDs and plans on charging women with murder for using them. So for those who are not aware, if we have some, you know, guys in the chat that may not be familiar, uh, IUD is a form of birth control. Uh, I don't want to get too, you know, graphic here, but long story short, it's a, a longer, a longer term option of birth control, meaning that unlike the pill, it's not something you have to take every day. It's, it's, I'm just trying to be uh, clean about this. They put it inside of you and it stays there for a while. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, but now you see states like Louisiana is uh, voting on a bill to criminalize IUDs and plans on charging women with murder who, who use them. That's happening in Louisiana. That is the damage are actually the danger about leaving it up to the states. That's the problem. So what's going to happen is women who live in Louisiana, obviously, especially if they want to get IUD, they're going to have to go to another state to do that. And then I don't know what kind of laws they may have in place. Like they may have penalties for people who do that, who leave Louisiana and go to another state to do it. And I just think that's, that's ridiculous. Like that's not even, so what's next? You're going to get rid of the pill. You're going to tell women in Louisiana they can't take the pill. It's it's complicated. It's complex. We could have a whole hour discussion on it. But I do want to go ahead and get to the next story. So I did have more information on uh, Nina Turner's uh, election, what happened there, and the struggles that she is going to face or that she has been facing coming from the democratic party. So she had an interview recently with Ryan Grimm on the Hill. And I want you to hear what she said. And there's a lot that goes into this because there's other things that, um, other videos I'm going to show you too. That's going to give you more of an explanation about those threats that the squad faced. And I want to get your opinion on that as well, but let's go ahead and get into this video. And I want you to hear what she says about 
the Democratic Party. Well, Chantel Brown defeated Nina Turner twice this year, officially on Tuesday for the second time. We are very lucky to be joined now by Nina Turner, who is here to offer some reactions on what happened in the race. There was an influx of pro-Israel money that came into the race, and I know we're going to get into all of that. Um, there were similar patterns in both of those races uh, that played out over the course of this last year. So, Nina, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Emily. Yeah, it's always, it's always great to talk to you. And I'm just going to start off by asking for some reflections on this the second of two campaigns that you uh, ran this year. Yeah, back to back because of the special election. I will say it was not so much that she defeated me as much as big money defeated me in both times. If there had been a strictly head to head, woman to woman race, there is no doubt that I would be Congresswoman Nina Turner at this moment. But unfortunately, dark money groups flooded into this race as they did last year. Um, Super PACs flooded in here. We know that a crypto billionaire jumped into this race placing a million dollars. And people have to ask themselves, it wasn't anything so spectacular about her run. So why is it that cryptocurrency billionaire and and uh, oil baroness and others. I mean, Emily, they were making up super PACs. At a certain point, there were so many super PACs in this race against me. It was, it was, dis it was, it was very, we, we couldn't keep up with the number of super PACs. So I and this is something that is always going to be an issue. See, basically what the Democratic Party has done when the first round of the squad won, when you had AOC, Anna Presley, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, when they got through, that wasn't supposed to happen, according to the Democratic Party, the establishments in the Democratic Party. They did not expect them to win. Uh, Crowley did not expect AOC to beat him. That's why he didn't show up until he started to realize that the poll numbers were closer than he would have thought they would have been. Then all of a sudden he wanted to show up and try to speak, but it was too late, right? So what I believe has happened is I believe that after those races, and especially going into 2020 and some Cory Bush beating uh, Lacey, that definitely was not supposed to happen, according to them. So what I believe has happened is that they have adjusted their strategy to try to prevent any other progressives from getting into Congress. That does not surprise me. I predicted that would happen once they figured out, wait a minute, these progressives actually had a chance of getting in. Let's see what we can do to stop that. That's where the money comes in. So this is something that is always going to be an issue is the money. And I don't know what happened to this, but at one point I remember we were focusing on Citizens United ending that. At one point we were focusing on getting money out of politics. That's, I don't really hear much about that anymore. And this is one of the reasons why I don't agree with the strategy anymore. The money is always going to be issue. Look at all the money that came in for Chantel Brown that they poured in. How are you going to beat that, right? Like, how are you going to overcome that? How are you going to stop that? Because now they know that progressives are getting in. So they're putting in even more and more and more money to create more ads, more negative ads, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll continue to do that. And they're going to continue to do that to any of the progressives. If they try to push back against the establishment, they'll do that. They'll get someone who's establishment to primary challenge Corey Bush. They'll get someone whose establishment to primary challenge AOC. See, AOC knows this, so she know how to play the game. She worked for a politician before. So this is a problem. This is a big part of the problem is the money. And sometimes people tell me like, you need to be more positive and more optimistic. And I'm like, well, no, with this strategy, until you get the money out, it's not going to work anymore. And even though we got the round of, of progressives that we did get in, what have they done? They haven't done anything. We had a long conversation about this Friday evening. They're not doing anything. Let's go back into the video. She's going to tell you more about the Democratic Party. I think a larger reflection beyond my run, because we see this pattern happening all over the country where races are no longer decided at the ballot box. They're decided in boardrooms across this country. That how does that impact this very still very young uh, representative of democracy and what does that mean going forward when big money can decide who leads specific communities knowing that they really don't care 
about the needs, the hopes and the dreams and even the fears of said communities. So did you hear that? She just said that big money decides and leads the communities. The people aren't even leading their own communities. Yeah, and after, after the race, uh, Justice Democrats gave a rather, rather what I thought was almost startling uh, comment to Kale Lacey, my colleague at The Intercept, for an article she wrote on the race where she asked, you know, where, where were you? You, know, you guys backed uh, Nina Turner last time around. Why do you get in this time? And they gave an unusually blunt and honest answer. They said, there's so much dark money, so much big money being spent on against Nina Turner that we have to make decisions on, you know, the, if the country is a chessboard, we have to decide, you know, where we're going to move our pieces and we can't afford to keep up with the amount of spending that is th being thrown down against, uh, against Nina Turner. Uh, meanwhile, let's talk about that for a second. Let's hear this one more time. What he just said. Listen to listen to this. Justice Democrats gave a rather rather what I thought was almost startling uh, comment to Kale Lacey, my colleague at The Intercept, for an article she wrote on the race. Where she asked, you know, where where were you? You know, you guys backed uh, Nina Turner last time around. Why do you get in this time? And they gave an unusually blunt and honest answer. They said, "There's so much dark money, so much big money being spent." on against Nina Turner that we have to make decisions on, you know, the, if the country is a chessboard, we have to decide, you know, where we're going to move our pieces and we can't afford to keep up with the amount of spending that is th being thrown down against, uh, against Nina Turner. Uh, so justice Democrats, long story short, decided not to move their chess piece in Nina's direction. That's really what that means. Yes, there was a lot of dark money that came in. Yes, again, we always know that that's going to be a problem. This is not new. This is always going to be a problem. But just as Democrats just said, that's the organization, that they could not afford basically to move their chess piece in Nina's direction. They have money. They have billionaire money, which I've talked about before on this show, how they take money from George Soros and other billionaires. That's why some people left that organization, to be honest. So they have the money, but they're choosing where they want to put that money, who they want to actually invest in. And they didn't want to invest in this direction. That's really what they're saying, but they're trying to say it in a nice way. Let's go back in. Meanwhile, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which had backed you in uh, the previous race, ended up endorsing Chantel Brown, who became a member of of the CPC, uh, you told Jordan Sheridan, who's done some terrific uh, reporting on this race. Jordan Sheridan of Status Quo, independent news outlet, uh, that some of the the squad members had been kind of threatened to stay away from the race. I've done a little bit of reporting on that, and uh, I've I've heard that the con the Congressional Black Caucus, in particular, uh, was was animated about this race. And so I kind of want to ask: Is that what you had heard? And also. Why? I'm not I'm not breaking any news to say that both you and Chantel Brown are both black. So what why why would the Congressional Black Caucus be so invested in one candidate over the other here? So he's talking about two different things here. So I do want to come out and just explain this because there's two different caucuses here that we're talking about. There is the progressive caucus, which were the ones that did not endorse Nina Turner, chose to endorse Chantel Brown. And the squad is a part of that, right? So is Rokana, Pramila Jayapal, and a bunch of other people that really aren't progressives, but we're not going to get at all of that tonight. And then there is the Congressional Black Caucus. That is uh, congressional members that are black. <laughs> I'm just saying, just basically progressive members, not progressive, congressional members that are black. That includes Jim Clyburn. So you know where we're going with that. Now, before she gives her answer, which I think is really important, I do want to explain to you that the Congressional Black Caucus, they're not always on our side. The Congressional Black Caucus actually backed and supported Joe Biden's crime bills. That tell you everything you need to know about the Congressional Black Caucus. So there's that. So... Let's go into this. I want you to hear what she says about why they decided not to endorse her 
and decided to endorse Chantel Brown. And like Ryan just said, both of them are black. So listen to this. If that's what you had heard. Yeah, I heard I heard something very similar, Ryan, no doubt about it. I mean, they need to answer that question. Um, I think that you know, even from the last race last year, I was told by a supporter that navigates those spaces. And this will is very uh, germane to this race, too. But I was told by a supporter who actually navigates the corporate Democrat spaces. And, and they asked these people, you know, why do you guys come at Nina Turner so hard? You know, she's a Democrat, too. And he was told I'm not the right kind of Democrat. So I. Whoop. That's the part I wanted you to hear. Let me come out. Let's hear that part again. Notice you heard Nina Turner say, they said, well, Nina Turner's a Democrat too. Listen, listen to this. This is why I told you, you can't, this party is not where it's at. That navigates to- those spaces. And this will, is very uh, germane to this race too. But I was told by a supporter who actually navigates the corporate Democrat spaces. And, and they asked these people, you know, why do you guys come at Nina Turner so hard? You know, she's a Democrat too. And he was told I'm not the right kind of Democrat. So I. Bingo. Let's talk about the right kind of Democrat. I'll break that down for you. Someone who takes corporate money. We'll leave all the other stuff out. I'm not going to get into race. I'm not going to get into gender. I'm not going to get any of that. Not another identity stuff. Because like Ryan said, both Nina Turner and Chantel Brown, they're both black women. So you got to leave the odd Paul out of this. Somebody who takes corporate money. That's what it's really about. They're not really looking for these candidates that are running these grassroots campaigns. They're not really, they really don't want real progressives in. They want people like Chantel Brown, who's actually a neoliberal but they can say that she's progressive. They don't want real progressives in. That's not the right kind of Democrat to them. Do you see how it works? That's coming from the Congressional Black Caucus. You're like, yeah, you know, she's one of us, but she's not one of us. This is why, and I mean this with the utmost respect, Why do people still want to try to go into a party like this? The party is already telling you you're not the right kind of Democrat. They don't want you there. They've already got people to not endorse you, even if they wanted to endorse you. Other progressives. I don't understand why people still want to go into this party. Like, this is the thing. What do you mean not the right kind of Democrat? And this is why I say all of the progressives in Congress should leave D.C. and they should start something on the outside. They have a large following. They can get millions of people in the streets. Because as long as you stay in this party, in the two-party system, you're going to have to do what the party wants you to do. And we've already seen that happen multiple times Obviously, recently with Nina Turner's election, they wouldn't even let them endorse Nina Turner. And AOC's endorsement, in my opinion, like I said, I don't even think that counts. How do you come in the night before? The night before. But you can tweet all day, every day about supporting Jessica Cineros. Because I'm willing to bet you that Jessica Cineros, in reference to her campaign, she already got the approval that it was okay for her to endorse Jessica Cineros. They were told not to endorse Nina Turner. So why do you want to go into this party? You have Corey Bush, who last I heard, talking to people who have been on the ground, Corey Bush's office, they're not allowed to talk to people. Why do you want to go into this party? Why do you want to go into a party that they only want a right kind of Democrat, the people that take corporate money, that are not going to challenge the billionaires, the millionaires, Why you want to go into a party that doesn't want to give everybody universal health care, doesn't want to give everyone paid family leave, doesn't want to cancel student loan debt? Why do you want to go into a party that doesn't run on the same issues that you're running on? 
How are these things going to pass in Congress? Because I used to think that this strategy would really work, but now you, you think about it now that we've seen what we've seen and I reflect back on it. How are they going to pass bills and legislation if the party doesn't even agree with the issues that they ran on? How is this going to happen? Let's go back in. She has more to say. I think that that answers the question even in this race as well, because I'm not the right kind and being the right kind means that I speak up and I speak out. I center the people that I'm running to serve, not corporate interests, not owner donors. And so that is a problem for certain Democrats. And we know that the corporatist powers, whether they're whether they're rocking for Republicans or rocking for Democrats, they're rocking. <laughs> and we know that they control. Unfortunately, they control the lovers of power in this country and something must be done about it. And I rail against that all the time. So that doesn't make me particularly the flavor yeah. for well, the congressional for, you know, for the for the Congressional Black Caucus. Yeah. And she just said the corporate money controls all of it. We're going to skip past uh, this woman here. I, I don't know her name. I'm sorry. Uh, but there's something else that she says here about choosing people. These were a falsism. There's sometimes, you know, when you're running as a candidate and people might pull stuff from your background and manipulate it for their for their purposes. On this, you know, being um, being labeled as anti-Israel, anti-Semitic was a flat out lie. And so I had a very good team, uh, Jewish leaders, director and, and coordinators yeah. on my team that you know helped me to begin to have those kind of conversations to seek first to understand and then to be understood understood to, to quote Stephen Covey. And so I approached it in that way. Like this is a lie. There's no there's no gray here. This is a lie used to to malign my name. And I did make some inroads. You know, I did have some Jewish leaders tell me that they know that it was a lie. Some Jewish leaders were in the rooms where things were being plotted against me, knowing that it is, was in fact a lie. And we see groups like APAC and DMFI, Democratic Majority for Israel, they're doing that to several candidates. Let us not forget that in 2020, after Senator Bernie Sanders, who is Jewish, <laughs> after his heart attack, DMFI put out one of the most disgusting commercials against Senator Bernard Sanders. In I and I remember that too. I remember that happening. And that's why I said, I think back on it and I say again, if Bernie Sanders, I don't think he will, but if Bernie Sanders tried to run again as a Democrat, I would be like, are you serious? They don't want you there. They're doing everything that they can. Listen, if there's one group that the Republicans and the Democrats are against, it's the left. It's the progressives. Republicans don't want them there. And the establishment Democrats don't want them there. This is why I say you got to leave the two-party system. They, they don't want you there. They're going to do everything they can to try to stop you or prevent you from getting there. Iowa. So Democratic majority for Israel, you know, they I mean, what they're doing, I mean, they're 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 fighting against uh, people like Summer Lee, who's running and, and just a whole host of candidates. And it seems that they come down particularly hard against candidates, progressive black women. Uh, and, and that's a pattern that they have. And it doesn't matter that the candidates that they back from time to time on the opposite side are black. We have to question the impact of outs, not just outside money, but also do people get to just totally make up stuff? about you something that inflammatory you know it's very hurtful so emily you're right the the large jewish i served the, the this community part of the jewish community when i was a state senator so i've always had a, the largest portion of the jewish community as a state senator and this the congressional district is half was half of my senate district so i'm not new to this community but what these types of groups are able to do is is, is terrible and people should speak out against it a little more i'm glad for j street you know, uh, groups, even my local, I had a lot of local um, leaders and just activist types actually write letters to the editor in the Cleveland Jewish News. And that was refreshing for me this time around. I didn't necessarily have that last time, but a lot of Jewish leaders actually spoke up this time and that, that really made me proud. Hmm. And, and Someone just said something in the chat that I really do want to highlight here because I think this is important. Uh, Pookie Wood said Bernie had that chance in 2016. 
he should have started a third party then or flipped or into a third party for 2020. I agree 100%. I agree. Uh, let's scoot head, a little bit ahead. There was something here that she said about them choosing people. I want to make sure I, I highlight that point. Other things. Oh, no, just how they, you know, sl slandered or went against Senator Sanders. No, it was about me being divisive. Right. There are a lot of polling going on because I had people in my circles who live in this district. So they were getting the polls. They were tracking, trying to see what would stick to me. So they just turbo boosted the message they, they did against me last time. So the foundation was I'm, I'm divisive. I'm not a real Democrat. You know that because they know this district is solidly Democrat just solidly. And so they were playing on that, 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 and they just turbo boosted. A matter of fact, Ryan and Emily, I got a hit piece against me in my mailbox just yesterday. And I'm just shaking <laughs> my head because they're still coming. It was, they still coming. Right. I, but I have my grandson. I tell that's not the part I wanted. There's a part and here. Thinking, if I you know, I had it. one of my dear friends say to me, well, you know, uh, Nina, they, they must and that is why I say that if these groups had not jumped in, if these people had not jumped into this race and it was just a head to head, I would have won this race both times. And on that point, I think this is oh, go ahead, Ryan. Did you have a question? Oh, no. I mean, I was just going to ask what's next for you. But yeah. could... no, let me see if this is the part. Give me just a second. Ukraine going on. You got inflation, you know, trying to figure out all kinds of things that are going wrong, both internationally and domestically. And the president jumped into this race. So that tells you the level of pressure that my team and I were under, especially the last two weeks of this race. And that is why I say that if these groups had not jumped in, if these people had not. Okay. I think I may have played it already, but there was one part here where she said they can pick who they want. And I think it was the part going back to the congressional black caucus. And yes, it was that part. Give me just a second. Uh, comment to Kale Lacey, my colleague at The Intercept, for an article she wrote on the against Nina Turner that we have to make decisions. On, you know, the, if the country is a chess, they have to make decisions. I know that part. Why would, why would the Congressional Black Caucus be so invested yes, in one candidate here. over the other here, if that's what you had heard? Yeah, I heard I heard something very similar, Ryan, no doubt about it. I mean, they need to answer that question. Um, I think that, you know, even from the last race last year, I was told by a supporter that navigates those spaces. And this will is very uh, germane to this race, too. But I was told by a supporter who actually navigates the corporate Democrat spaces and, and they asked these people, you know, why do you guys come at Nina Turner so hard? You know, she's a Democrat, too. And he was told I'm not the right kind of Democrat. So I think that that answers the question even in this race as well, because I'm not the right kind. And being the right kind means that I speak up and I speak out. I center the people that I'm running to serve, not corporate interests, not owner donors. And so that is a problem for certain Democrats. And we know that the corporatist powers, whether they're whether they're rocking for Republicans or rocking for Democrats, they're rocking. <laughs> and we know that they control. Unfortunately, they control the lovers of power in this country and something must be done about it. And I rail against that all the time. So that doesn't make me particularly the flavor. <laughs> for well, the congression for, you know, for the for the congressional maybe it black was caucus. Yeah, and folks on a national level might not realize there's a pretty significant Jewish community in this district. And Nina, this that people I really don't know who this person is. There's sometimes, you know, when you're running as a candidate and people might pull stuff from your background and manipulate. Okay. So there was another part, and I'll I'll have to find it later because I do need to move into the next clip. But they can pick who they want. They 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 pick who they want. The Democratic Party said they can do that. So this is something I think people really need to understand. If they decide you're not the person that they want, they'll do everything they can to make sure that you don't win. And like I said before, the squad got in, but again, they weren't expecting those people to win. They weren't expecting them to beat those establishment Democrats. They've adjusted. DG Daniel said, it was sad to watch Nina grovel for this seat. She should be outside kicking their ass. 
I hear you. Bad cookies. Nina will secretly take corporate money like AOC does. Oh boy. Gamer says dim party is the graveyard part of Shama's quote. Thank you for the super chat. Aperturum. Aperturum. Nina sitting there acting like she doesn't know that she was abandoned even by the fake progressive squad. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Like if they did that to me, I couldn't do it. Bill said Nina is a very effective sheep dog for the DNC. She is the one that is pulling the people AOC used to pull before she so obviously sold out. Wow, Bill. Wow, wow. Uh, I told you earlier on that more information has come out about those threats that were made to the squad. So I do want to share that information because Jordan has come out. He made a video about that while he's driving, talking about what the threats were. I want you to hear what those threats are. And then I want to hear your opinion because after I heard what the threats were, I was again, even more disappointed and upset with the squad because I feel like let me play the video. Let me play the video. Here we go. But when you look at when Justice Democrats and all these groups and the squad look at it, she didn't lose by that much in August. And your and your strategy or your conclusion is, eh, we're gonna sit this one out. It's honestly I have never I have never um I'm a journalist, so I, I, I've never, like, latched on to, like, fraud squad and all this. I know people want me to, but, like, I'm a journalist. I, I'm, not, I'm not going to, I'm not an activist. Sure, I give my opinion, but, like, it has nothing to do with access. I just, it's not my role to tell you to dem enter or dem. Hit that like button, guys. Sometimes I forget to tell people. Go ahead and give that a big old like. Thumbs up. I'm exit or to cancel the squad or whatever like that. But I will just factually tell you, this is not what people elected the squad to do. This is uh -oh. not what people who can't afford to donate, donated to or volunteered for. And as Nina Turner said last night, they were threatened. The squad was threatened not to support her. Here we go. Well, I can tell you, Based on a few conversations I've had, and not not directly with Dina, Corey Bush and some others were threatened, not physically, but threats, you know, if you support Dina Turner, uh, Democrat, the Democrat establishment, we're going to be sending out the bat signals, the super PACs, to go against you in your re-elections. Corey Bush is up for re-election in a tough primary in St. Louis, that if you support Nina Turner, we are going to make sure that big money is against you. You will not have the Congressional Black Caucus endorsement, and we will be coming hard for you. That I know for sure. Hold up. Let's listen to this again. Here were the threats, ladies and gentlemen. Here are the threats. Is up for re-election in a tough primary in St. Louis. Democratic establishment, we're going to be sending out the bat signals, the super PACs, to go against you in your re-elections. Cory Bush is up for re-election in a tough primary in St. Louis, that if you support Nina Turner, we are going to make sure that big money is against you. You will not have the Congressional Black Caucus endorsement, and we will be coming hard for you. That I know for sure happened. And you want to know something? It's still no excuse not to support Nina Turner. So from what we've heard, the threats had to do with their career in politics. We're going to send out super PACs against you. You're not going to get the CBC endorsement. We're going to do all this kind of stuff to make sure that you don't win next time. Those were the threats. What happened to, I know at least AOC said this. I can't speak for the others. What happens to, I don't care if I'm a one-term congressperson. 
What happened to that? If you didn't care if you were going to be a one-term congressperson, then those threats that they made, we're going to send super PACs out against you. We're going to send in more money. You're not going to get the CBC endorsement. That wouldn't have mattered. So this just basically confirmed some of the suspicions that I've had, which I've mentioned on the show, that they're looking out for their career. That's what it's about. They would do much better. They could do more good if they were not in D.C. Corey Bush was doing really well. I'm not speaking financially here, but as an activist, she was doing really well during the Ferguson protests out there with the people in the community. Those were the threats, ladies and gentlemen. Those were the threats. I'm going to send out super PACs. Make sure you don't win next time. That's when you come in and you say, again, you were supposed to be coming in hostile as a justice Democrat. That's when you push back and you say, well, then you do what you got to do. The fact that we just heard that, what does that tell you? What does that tell you about this strategy? What does that tell you about the squad? This is done. They're not going to, they're definitely not going to do anything. They're not going to fight for you. They're not going to fight for the people. That's all they have to do is threaten to send super PACs out against them, to threaten their career, to threaten endorsements. That's all they got to do. So then what's the point? This goes back to something I said when I was on Jimmy Dore's show. The real fighters that were in D.C. that fought back against war, imperialism, fought back for the people, the Democratic establishment pushed them out. That's why you don't see them there anymore. One of them has been on this show, Cynthia McKinney. She said so herself. I'll see if I can find that clip. She said so herself. They're not going to keep you there if you're actually going to fight and push. Now, this is where some people will come in and say, well, that's why we need more progressives in the House. Bruh, you don't think the establishment has already figured this game out by now? You think they're going to let us get more progressives in there? They're not. Might get lucky, get like one or two here and there. But they're not going to let the progressives become the establishment in the house through the democratic party or the Republican party. In fact, the establishment Democrats and the GOP would actually do bipartisanship to prevent, to prevent them from coming in. The GOP and the democratic establishments would actually join together in a bipartisan way to prevent the rest of those progressives from getting in. Like I said, at the end of the day, Democrat or Republican, they're in DC. They can all go to the same country club. Whether they agree on social issues or not. This is a wake up call if you have not been woken up or you're kind of on the fence and you're trying to do this kind of thing because what does this tell you? What you do when you're being threatened by corporate villain bullies is you punch back. What any of these squad members should be doing if they're being threatened, uh, that we're going to come after you in this election if you support Nina Turner, uh, blah, 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 is you have your press people contact CNN, MSNBC, hell, Fox News, whatever it is, because they cannot resist, they cannot resist Dem Party fighting. That's true. They love that story. De Democrat Party disarray. And you say Congresswoman Bush would like to come on. Uh, to reveal threats she's getting for the Democratic Party. 
not to suppress, not to support Nita Turner. You would be called back in five minutes. You want to know how I know? Because I worked for these corporate outlets. They favor conflict and fighting way more than anything else because it's good for ratings. You put them on blast publicly. You put them on blast publicly. That. I don't agree with Jordan on everything, but he's right about that. That's what you do. You go to the media. They're always around in D.C. anyway. They're usually trying to get into your face to get you to talk. You go to the media. Why? They, were, they couldn't do that. They won't do that. I'm still wondering, where's this hostile takeover? Where's the hostility supposed to be coming in? This just proves my point. This is what I've been saying. Whomever is threatening you is threatening you. They're threatening to come after you. If you support Nina Turner, and you know what that does? Number one, it actually helps you in your election if you're truly worried about your election because it rallies your base of supporters and activists to stick with you because you stuck with Nina. It gets media attention. It puts the whomever, whether it's the Congressional Black Caucus, Nancy Pelosi, whatever. It puts pressure on them. It puts them on blast. It rallies your troops in St. Louis, or if you're Rashida Tlaib in Detroit, or if you're Ilhan Omar in Minnesota. Do you know how much attention that would have received by the American people if they did that? If they went to the press and told them that they were being threatened and the threats that were made because they wanted to endorse Nina Turner, do you know how big that story would have been? That would have exposed a lot of corruption in D.C. That Again, like I told you guys, most people are not aware of this. Most of the things that I talk about on this show that we talk about in independent media, most Americans are not aware that these things are going on, but they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do it. Now, you know what the threats were, ladies and gentlemen, people kept asking me that. And I was like, I don't know yet, but now, you know, now I want to give a shout out to someone. Thank you so much for sharing this with me. This is something you guys got to see. I'm not going to read the whole article. I'm just going to read one paragraph. Now, this is by Lauren Elizabeth. She wrote an article that says, please stop donating to the Democratic Party. I beg you, and here's why. And the paragraph I want to highlight is actually towards the bottom. Doobie doobie doo. Aha, here we go. Listen to what Lauren Elizabeth said. Oh, dear. What happened to my screen here? Okay, it's back to normal. They won't even end the filibuster for this issue alone because they know it opens the door for other legislation. And then they're out of excuses not to do the bidding of their corporate donors. Why send money to them? When there are so many better ways it can be spent. There are online resources pointing to organizations and networks that help people get access to abortions. Why not donate to them instead? Why not send money to strike funds for workers organizing their workplaces? The list of better, more productive alternatives is endless. And then she ends with this. I know there are loyal Democratic voters who are as frustrated by these circumstances as I am. No matter how much I might vehemently disagree with you on a wide variety of issues, my problem is not with you. This needs to be a moment when we set differences aside, sit down and have a dialogue with each other. Nothing will improve until we do. And of course, if someone finds a specific candidate that they want to support, then do so, but keep 
that money away from the DCCC. Congress alone will not save us. And this is the point I want to drive home. All we have are our communities and each other. Organize and fight back. That article is by Lauren Elizabeth. I highly recommend you read it. She went off. She went off. Eric, can you put the link to this article in the chat so people can find the full article? She went off. And she was right when she says, she points out all these different things that the Democrats can do that they're not doing. Blue Moon Red Wine said, that's the threat. I thought it would be a death threat. What spineless shit is this? Hi, Lucy. Delthea, who's a savvy member, says to get your pension as a congressional representative, you need three terms. Unless you are independently wealthy, getting reelected always matters. You guys hear this? Thank you for the super chat, salty granny. Thank you very much for the explanation. I'm so glad I found your channel. Thank you so much and welcome. I like that name, salty granny. Shout out to Felicia Good Bay for becoming a savvy member. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop. Welcome. And thank you for this as well. Felicia said, love your show, Savvy. Thank you so much. I hope everyone can learn something from that segment because this is not. No. Nah. So much for, I don't care if I'm a one-term congressperson, right? People say a lot of things when they're running. <sighs> Austin Knitter, kind of questioning my third vote for Rashida with the pension bit in mind in light of bailing on Nina this cycle. Hmm. Are there any independent or third party candidates running in your district, Austinator? Couch said Biden's going to be a one term president calling it now. Cryptician says stop donating money to the Democratic Party. I'm begging you, man. All of you guys are saying, a lot of you are saying the same thing in the chat. You guys see. Cats out the bag. I mean, I've been saying this for months, but there you, now you, you see even other people are, are seeing saying the same thing now. Other people see this as well now. So that goes to show you they care more about their career. And that's that. Now I want to go ahead and move on to the final uh, story which is about Amazon. So I do have an update with the union situation there. There is something else that is going on now, but first I want to explain this to you for some of you who may be wondering, like, what does this mean? Uh, shareholder activists. So what is a shareholder activist? A shareholder activist is a person who attempts to use their rights as a shareholder of a publicly traded corporation to bring about change within or for the corporation. Why did I give you that definition? Because that's what we're getting into with the Amazon story. Although that has seemed to disappear. I think I lost it somewhere. That article is gone. What did I do? Give me just a second. I think I accidentally clicked on it. Eric, do you still have that link? I'll go to the super chat. It's for the salon story about the Amazon, the one you sent me. Thank you for the super chat, Carl. Can't change the Democratic Party from within. The biopoly has made ballot access and debate inclusion impossible for third parties. What to do? General strike? 60% voters are independent. How to unite them? Good question, Carl. Good question. Uh, what I usually tell people on here is we need to do like 80% direct action mutual aid, which a lot of us are, well, not a lot of us, but some of us are already doing that. 
and 20% electoral politics. And I think when it comes to electoral politics, we need to focus more on the local level than on the uh, federal level. Thank you for the super chat, Rodrigo. Sabi, one of the most gutsy lefties. Oh, thank you, Rodrigo. That's really sweet. Aha, you found it. All right, update with Amazon. So this is new. Taking the Amazon union battle to the C-suite, shareholders fight back against higher immorality. Listen to this. As union fights for contracts, big pension funds with billions in Amazon stock plan and assault on the corporate board. So this is something else that is happening also to go along with the labor organizing of Chris Smalls and other activists as well. So let's hear this, you guys. Organizers for the independent Amazon labor union, which stunned the world when it won a union election to represent several thousand workers at the corporate Bahamas facility in Staten Island, New York, are now waging a wider battle against Amazon labor practices. The union lost a May, excuse me, a May 2nd vote at a smaller Staten Island facility that primarily relies on part-time workers, but says it is reviewing its legal options amid reports that Amazon may have tried to intimidate workers. What? Amazon may have tried to intimidate workers? You don't say. You don't say. Let's let's go back in. All righty. In a potentially far more significant development, a coalition of the nation's largest public pension funds with billions of dollars in Amazon stock is urging shareholders to take the battle of Amazon's corporate suite. Here we go. AL, AL, blah, 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 blah. Sorry. ALU lost the vote at the secondary Amazon site on Staten Island known as LDJ5 by 618 to 380 after prevailing a month earlier at the larger JFK8 facility, where 2,654 workers voted for the union and 2,131 voting against. Amazon is legally challenging the results of that first vote. So that's important for people to know. Now let's go down here. I want to give you the update. This is important. Meanwhile, the coalition of large public pension funds is urging shareholders to confront Amazon's corporate leadership by voting out a pair of board directors who oversee Amazon's workplace and compensation policies at the upcoming May 25th shareholder meeting. So this is happening May 25th, so that's actually right around the corner. Wow, she is going by fast. Now, this is where I had to pause because I actually am familiar with one of the people listed here, and that just kind of blew my mind for a second. These activist shareholders, here we go, are specifically targeting Judy McGrath, the former CEO of MTV Networks, and Daniel P. Huttenlocker, Dean of MIT's Schwartzman College of Computing. Now, let me come out. So this was interesting for me to see. For those who are new and don't know, I used to work at MIT. I know who Daniel is. So seeing his name in this article, it was interesting. Let's just, <laughs> let's just go there. It was interesting. So here we go. The national effort is being led by New York City Comptroller Brad Lander and New York State Comptroller Tom DiNapoli, a pair of Democrat elected officials who preside over hundreds of billions of public pension funds. The New York City Retirement System and the New York State Common Retirement Fund hold 1.7 million shares of Amazon stock valued at approximately 5.3 billion. 
at an April 24, excuse me, 21 conference at the Harvard Club in Manhattan, several other elected treasurers from around the country committed to joining in the effort. At that forum, sponsored by the Open Society, for the long term, a nonprofit committed to sustainable investing and the Center for American Progress, Lander told attendees that it wasn't only Amazon's human resources policies that were risk ho- a risk to shareholders' long-term value, but its skewed compensation system, which paid its top five executives approximately $400 million last year, including $212 million in time-invested shares to CEO Andrew Jassy. Under the watch of Amazon's current corporate board, Lander said the pay ratio between the CEO and the median compensated employee is 6,474 to one. That tells you where their human capital management priorities lie. Let's highlight that. Again, this is the problem with capitalism. The pay ratio between the CEO and the median employee is 6,474 to one. That tells you where their human capital management priorities lie. Again, most of the money concentrated at the top. E.G. Butler said they're just trying to prevent the workers from getting a bigger share of the bag. This is insane. Cryptician said, wow, that's crazy. This is ridiculous. These are some of the people that during the pandemic, their wealth doubled. For some of the CEOs in this country, that's what happened to them. During the pandemic, their wealth doubled. He continued, Amazon's quota and other systems for mass managing its workforce place extraordinary pressure on its workforce, resulting in higher than average injury rates and costly legal and regulatory scrutiny. Turnover rates remain as high as 150%, leading some Amazon executives to worry about running out of hireable employees. Well, 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 look at that. If you're worried about running out of hired or hireable employees, maybe you should pay them more. Maybe you should treat them better. And then the employees that you have there won't leave. It's common sense. They know it. They just don't want to pay it. Bryce said that's some cartel ish. This is insane. They go on more here to say, let me come back in. They're talking about the great resignation. When I hear people say the great resignation, I think what's happening here in this moment in Amazon and many other places where people are simply walking out, they aren't going to take it anymore. I wonder why. I wonder why. It's not that they are leaving the workforce. They are looking for dignity and respect. Oh my God, why would we have to look for that? Right? The Pension Fund Forum featured remarks by Staten Island-based ALU organizers, Chris Smalls, Derek Palmer, Angelica Maldano, and Brett Daniels. Smalls, who was an Amazon supervisor when the pandemic first hit in early 2020, told the audience he had become concerned about the lack of personnel protective equipment and social distancing at the sprawling Staten Island facility. That's how all this started, you guys. Oh, man. And then it goes on into the Amazon labor story. 
Amazon founder Jeff Bezos recently bestowed a hundred million each on liberal commentator and activist ba Van Jones. I don't know if everyone was aware of that. I did know about that. And humanitarian chef Jose Andres, which observers have suggested help deflect criticism of Bezos' vanity space flight. You see? <sighs> One thing I think that's important for people to see, I'm going to show this and then I'm going to boot scoot. I always like to ask myself, who's invested in these companies? And these are things you can Google. I want you to look at some of the notable holders of Amazon. Some of these are not going to be a surprise to you. Vanguard Group, State Street Corp, Price T. Rowe Associates, Fidelity Investments, and what do you know, BlackRock. Now, BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street those three, it is not uncommon to find them together. They own so much. You'd be surprised. BlackRock is also buying up real estate. BlackRock and Vanguard are also shareholders with Warner and Disney. So this is important for people to see. Here's the full list here. I wanted to point out those. There's another port, another uh, portion of BlackRock there. Of course, I knew Bank of America's sellout ass would be here. Oh, excuse me, guys. Sorry. <laughs> sorry for the language. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate Bank of America. I hate them. <laughs> I don't hate people per se, but if there's one business I hate is Bank of America. Their customer service is awful. Um, but yeah, you can tell them I called them sellouts. So there. Uh, Schwab, Charles Investment, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, of course, of course. A lot of these people, they, they run together. You can look up another company and you'll see some of these same shareholders as shareholders of that company as well. There's a lot you can find. Bank of Montreal, they even got Canada shareholders as well. This is a long list. Warren Buffett. So see, this is why when I say if you really want to hit someone in the pocket, this is the thing. If you were to boycott Amazon and say, I'm not going to buy from Amazon anymore. Okay. That might have a slight effect on Amazon, but companies like Vanguard, State Street, let's go all the way down to BlackRock. They're shareholders in other companies as well. So they're not really going to be affected that much. They'll still get money from Disney. They'll still get money from Warner Group or Discovery Group, whatever they're called today. I think they changed their name. They'll still get money. This is why it's important to know who these shareholders are. This is why Sabby says, follow the money. But like I said, I knew Bank of America sell out at like they're such they're so skeezy. <laughs> God, <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate them. I hate Bank of America. All right. Um, but hopefully people learn something today. But yeah, Vanguard Group, State Street. It's just they're so they're so. That's the thing. That's why sometimes the boycotts only go so far.
I was going to show you this other one. Let's go group. I'm telling you, they are shareholders of so many other. I think JB, JB and I talked about um, Disney on RBN. We went through all the people. Um, Warner Brothers. Okay. Yeah, we went through all of the shareholders for Disney. And we went through all like the companies that um, Disney owns. Disney owns a lot of stuff. You'd be surprised. Relations. I think this is it. They know I'm looking up information. Okay, here we go. Warner Brothers Discovery. Warner Brothers Discovery. So... Mm hmm. This is another one you need to pay attention to. I'm going to show this to you guys. Let me share my screen. Where did I go? Let me share. This is another one I want you to see. This Warner Brothers Discovery, you need to uh, pay attention to them as well. So they... New P media powerhouse hosts the legacy Warner assets such as cable channels, TBS, TNT, HBO, CNN, as well as Warner Brothers movie and television studios, legacy discovery assets such as Discovery Channel, Food Network, HGTV, and TLC, CNN. And then they talk about their financials as well. HBO Max. This is why I tell people you really need to look at who's, who owns like the, the media because then you'll understand where the talking points come from. I'm past my time, but I could talk about this all night long. Like we could just sit here and just Google and stuff like that, but I actually have another appointment I have to go to. So I actually can't do that. Um, but we can do a rabbit hole show one day where I just take you guys, like we just go one by one, boom, who owns this? Who's a shareholder? Who da da da? And then you'll understand why things work the way that they do, right? What's this, Stephen? Who owns the AI? Is that AI or AL? Is AI who owns the AI? What AI? I'm terrible with uh, abbreviations, Stephen. I, I will tell you. You can ask like JB from. Uh, RBN. I tell JB all the time. I'm like, I don't know what these abbreviations mean. Like people text me all the time and they're like, R O T W X Z like Z. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know what that means. <laughs> or they'll be like, Sabby, A B L L. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. I'm terrible with that. I try. I try. Um, Angela said, I remember my grandfather going on strike for almost a year. That was tough going through, but the union helped each other and everyone got through it with a good contract. That was in the 80s. Yeah, man, things have really changed. Greg Bruce, who's a savvy member, says you could also consider people with criminal records to be hireable. That's true. That's a good point. Bryce says pay your workers. Yes. Why is that so difficult? Why is this so difficult for people to say? Algorithm? Sorry, yes, the algorithm. 
I don't know. That's a homework assignment for me. Thank you for that. Thank you for that homework assignment. Oh, Dimitri thought it was artificial intelligence. I would have thought that too, I think. Um, very interesting. Before I leave, I want to I want to show you this. Because I know I have a lot of, like, it's new people, more new people watching now. So some of you may not have seen this. I just want to show you what Cynthia McKinney said on here in reference to the squad. Now, I've shown this to people before that have been on here. But if you're a newbie, I want you to be able to hear. Is this the one? Lady Day. Um, they'll wash your troubles. They'll wash. Oh, nope. That's about jazz. I'm sorry. They're arm in arm. And that's what let me know. Hey, this is just theater. Oh, this is good. Listen to this part. I think I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, I'll just share it. I'll show you guys this. I want you to hear what she said because there was something she said here. Uh, where'd I go? About the squad. Listen to uh, listen to this. And so I understanding. So, you know, it's sort of like it's easy for us to be in our own shoes, but we also have to be in other people's shoes if we're going to have this ability to come together. So then I go to Washington and I'm under the Democratic Party banner, but I don't want these wars. I don't, you know, I had been catapulted because I spoke out against George Herbert Walker Bush's wars. When the wars became Democratic Party wars, Bill Clinton's wars, I, I was against them still. And so then that really taught me that the Democrats, in fact, in one of my concession speeches, um, I was one of the first victims of electronic voting machines because Georgia was the first state to actually deploy them. And I declared at that moment that electronic voting machines are a threat to U.S. national security. No. Oh, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Even back then, she was trying to warn people about the machines. Let me get to the squad part. Hold on. Let me get to that. Give me a thumbs up if you haven't yet, honey buns. Let's get to the squad part. I know it's when I ask a question. From your experience, because I, I keep saying this, I feel like, why are they so afraid? Okay, this is the one. Like, what is at stake here other than being a careerist? From your experience, do you feel like there's some sort of fear uh, in reference to their career as a politician? Or do you feel like they're just trying to to go along with the group? Well, first of all, you know, I, I'm I'm a radical in that I Oh, I was muted the whole time. Sorry. If we can put this in, um, can you put that link in um, type VNC? I think it's already on the notepad. If you can just add it to the thing, or maybe I can do that. Okay. You're doing it. Okay. Doobie doobie doo. Welcome to live streams with Sabby where anything can happen. Anything. Okay. And it should be at, um, yeah, I know how to do it. I can do it. Okay. I know where to start it from. So I think right about, this is where she's going to tell you why 
They're not doing anything. Pelosi. And they're not doing that. They're they're now just kind of going along with 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 the DNC, like the establishment. From your experience, because I, I keep saying this, I feel like why are they so afraid? Like what what is at stake here other than <laughs> being a careerist? From your experience, do you feel like there's some sort of fear uh, in reference to their career as a politician, or do you feel like they're just trying to to go along with the group? Well, first of all, you know, I, I'm I'm a radical in that I actually try to look at the genesis of things. I try to to get down to the root of what the issues are, what the causes are, you know, where the money comes from. And so the question I would ask is, uh, were Justice Democrats ever ours? What? And I, you know, the answer that I come to is no, they weren't. I never had anybody give uh, start uh, a movement with me for $20 million. I mean, you know, it just, the, the kind of money that flowed through their campaigns and continues to flow through their campaigns is not something that I ever, had access to and none of the other people who went afoul of that deep state entity. And did you guys hear that? They were never really ours. Never had someone try to start a campaign movement with, with anybody else for $20 million. So maybe what we're looking at, or maybe what we're confusing is uh, manufactured dissent as we um, also know about manufactured consent, but there's also manufactured dissent. And maybe that's what we're confusing. Mm, that's a good point. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing a lot about uh, Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin. Um, everybody seems to be pointing fingers at them and blaming them for the reason why things aren't getting done. But Glenn Greenwald brought it up and he, he referred to this as the rotating villain that if it wasn't for mm -hmm. Kirsten Cinema or Joe Manchin, it doesn't matter. Somebody else would be the rotating villain. Uh, what's your feeling about that? Well, um, yeah. And, and in fact, what we need to do is look at the performance in terms of policy of the Democratic Party. See, she calls it performance. And um, I think they fail on so many accounts. They have failed for me on the um, anti-war pro-peace ledger. They are now failing on immigration. They are uh, failing on labor. They are failing, the, you know, they, they, they just failing across the board, failed on, on health care. And so, um, I mean, it's a shame when you have an insurgent Republican campaign that's more leftist than, <laughs> than the Democrats. And so uh, what is actually going on here? I think what is happening is that we're seeing the reality of the deep state, that the Democrats can, in fact, their platform, I, I just had a meeting this morning with, um, insurgent Green Party members as well, who, uh, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, the Green Party has the most beautiful words that have been put in a political platform that exist in the United States today. The Green Party remains ineffective, and we have to look at why it is ineffective. The If we go back and look at some of the studies that were done around COINTELPRO and not very many of them were done, but David Cunningham, I believe is the name of the academician who looked at popular FBI practices in the COINTELPRO movement to destroy organizations. And you're a Fred Hampton leftist, so you understand about the destruction of um, black leadership and independent black leadership and the destruction of independent black organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most favorite um, uh, tool that was used by the FBI was infiltration. And so the Democrats are the, uh, the political party that ran uh, a record number of intelligence operatives um, on their uh, ledger 
as congressional candidates. I mean, this this would have changed, you know, it, we supposedly have separation of powers and checks and balances built into the governance structure of our of our country. Well, if you infiltrate the legislative branch with executive branch operatives, what do you have? You no yep. longer have the checks and balances and the separation of powers. So you are literally witnessing the destruction of certain features that make the U.S. governance structure unique and very special. You're looking at the destruction of it. And that's exactly what we're experiencing. Mm. Oops. I'm curious, when, when you Maybe were a it. congresswoman, did you feel any type of pressure from number one, the first African American woman coming from Georgia? There's that mm -hmm. in itself has its pressures. It's never easy yeah. to be the first. My questions took too long back then. Um, Here we go. So the Republicans who were in the congressional um, majority at the time proposed a committee, a special ad hoc. Whoops! I think I need to speed up a little bit. At what's happening in Venezuela, what was happening in Venezuela under the tenure of Hugo Chavez that made him so. Oh yeah, I forgot about that part. Whose uh, political ideas are unheard. The un, when the un finally come together and say, no, we have the nucleus for a movement, a movement that can be successful and that can make change. Mm. I know that um, I was reading that Ralph Nader said one time that I'm so sorry, you guys, I dragged you through all of this, but this is actually the question. Sorry, he actually offered help to the squad that if they needed advice, <laughs> if they need any kind of help, like someone who's kind of been through, through this, he offered, offered help and they didn't seek out that help. Why do you think that is? because they never belong to us anyway. They are there for the purpose of making you, the Fred Hampton leftists, and people who think like you and me, think that we have representation, when in fact, we don't have representation. Here we go. Not a single one of the 535 that are there is willing to go to the mat for principle. Mm. Now, so what is our imperative then? Did you hear what she just said? I'm going to end it on this part. She said, let me make sure I get back. Okay. Whose uh, political ideas are unheard. The un, when the un finally come together and say, no, we have the nucleus for a movement, a movement that can be successful and that can make change. See, we have to come together and say no. That's why nothing ever, it, we continue to do the same thing over and over. We are not going to get change. And then this part. Mm. I know that um, I was reading that Ralph Nader said one time that he actually offered help to the squad that if they needed advice, <laughs> if they need any kind of help, like someone who's kind of been through, through this, he, he offered, offered help and they didn't seek out that help. Why do you think that is? Because they never belong to us anyway. They are there for the purpose of making you the Fred Hampton leftists and people who think like you and me think that we have representation when in fact, we don't have representation. Not a single one of the 535 that are there is willing to go to the mat for principle. That part. That's the part I want you to take home with you. Or if you're already at home. That's the part I want you to reflect on. Here's a little homework assignment. I want you to think about what she said. That none of them are willing to go to the mat on principle. That's what I want you to take with you tonight. Reflect on that. And then I want you to think about if you feel this strategy is still working. I'll take those comments on Rockfin. 
Okay. Thank you so much for the tip on Rockfin. Roger, hi, Sab. Was listening in the background about what you said about NYS comptroller Dinopoli said about shares in Amazon. Mom asking me, why don't I get a job at Amazon? Because she heard you say Amazon. So I had to go into a whole thing about how terrible they are. She was like, how I know all this. I had to explain corporate media not talking labor issues. We'll have to rewind. Heading to Albany again. Tomorrow to rally for the New York Public Banking Act gets passed before legislative session ends June 2nd. We'll keep you informed. Regarding all these times Dems had the chance to codify Roe v. Wade into law and didn't y'all say Clinton, Obama, and Biden, but you always forget about the most consequential Dem president, James Carter, who unlike the past two and the current Dem president, as we are about to find out, Carter, although didn't serve eight years, he had both chambers of Congress and his party to do it for all four years. Unlike O and C had two years. Ah, that's a good point. Thank you so much, Roger. That's a good point. I do forget about Jimmy Carter sometimes. Someone mentioned Jimmy Carter to me recently saying he should run for president. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, yes. That's all I have for you guys tonight. Love Rogers Rockfin comments. Yes, I know. Truth Bearer said Cynthia McKinney was beloved here until they brainwash people to hate her based on propaganda. Yep. That's what they'll do. Let's go with that tonight, you guys. Let's leave with that. I want you to reflect on what she said about people being willing to go to the mat for principle. And I want you to think about the people that we have in Congress right now and we have in the Senate. And it could have been people that you canvass for, people that you donated to. I'm one of those people that have done those things as well. And I want you to try not to have this favorite, this favoritism towards them because you know them or because you canvass for them or because you thought they were going to be your hero. And I want you to uh, think about what Cynthia McKinney said. Who is willing to go to the mat for principle? That's my time. All right, guys, have a good night. Keep up the fight.